Um, let me start then. So um, I'm Rosie Fraser and um, I'm the project manager working for the Diocese of London on this project. Um, I just want to say thank you all very much for signing up for the workshop and it's lovely to see everybody. Um, I wanted to talk through the housekeeping very quickly which hopefully is very simple. Please um, just keep your microphones on mute unless you're a speaker. Um, and uh, also, um, if you want to get up at any time for coffee or do anything, clearly, please feel free to do so. I will introduce each speaker as we go through the agenda, and then we will have uh, a section for questions and answers at the end of each speaker. Um, at the end of each presentation and um, uh, it would be really helpful if you are able if you could type a question into the chat so that we can pick them up as we go but um, if you don't want to type into the chat that's absolutely fine just raise your hand um, and then we will call for uh, questions and Becky and Hannah are on the lookout to see any raised hands um, and hopefully that will mean we can pick up anybody who has a question and obviously if all else fails just unmute and ask the question <laughs> hopefully that's okay so um, as I set out at the beginning uh, we will put the slides and the recording onto the diocese website and we will send you out a link in a couple of days after this when we have um, when we've got that set up. So what I would like to just run through today is in this presentation is a very brief introduction to the project, how we conceived it and um, how we managed it. I just to put up an image of the church. Um, and just to see how it looked when it was originally built. And obviously I don't intend to talk too much about the building because Rebecca will be talking a little bit more about the building and how she's researched it in her presentation. So I just wanted to give you a very, very brief background just to say that the building was completed in 1829 and designed by Sir Charles Barry. Um, and the reason that that is interesting is because he was the architect who helped design, design the Houses of Parliament. Um, the building is grade two star listed and it's on the Historic England uh, Heritage at Risk Register category A, meaning that it's actually in a very poor condition. Um, and uh, the turrets were, one of them I believe was struck by lightning and hence has uh, caused structural issues. And the aisles um, were, the aisle roofs are, are slash were in very poor condition, but are currently being repaired with support from a Historic England um, Historic uh, Repairs Grant, which is fantastic news. We have, with this building, been looking at undertaking, um, working out what we're going to do with it. So we've undertaken a feasibility study, looked at the space and looked at how we might use it. Originally, we're thinking we might convert it to office and community space. Clearly, um, <laughs> we're, we're having a little rethink on that because we're not convinced about the demand for office space anymore. However, um, that is part of an ongoing project. And um, in terms of refurbishing the entire building, we're looking at a major capital project of about 7 million. So it's quite a significant building um, and quite a significant undertaking. Here are some photos just so that you can see the interior from the gallery that's taken from the west end looking at the east end and then you can see uh, the front of the building which this is a better photograph because at the moment it's got scaffolding up on the west end and the scaffolding all over the building which actually although it makes it look awful is a really good sign that something is happening. And here's another picture of the interior of the building looking at the West End and you can see the nave ceiling is in a very poor condition and uh, has netting to stop plaster falling. So in terms of who we all were and how we came together, um, 
Kevin Rogers, who is Head of Parish Property Support at Diocese of London, um, wanted obviously to try and uh, come up with a new use and repair solution for the building. Um, so he pulled together a group of people that he's worked with before and um, we have worked through this project now for the past two years together, which has been really um, excellent fun and just a really nice project to work on. Um, and so what I really liked about this project at the start was the way we all sat around the room, sat around the table together and we all brainstormed how we thought we could contribute and how we thought we could take it forward and it was a really collaborative process and one that I haven't actually sat down before normally it's sort of a person leading or a, a group leading but this was just a whole group of people sitting down and seeing how they could make the project better and I that just worked really well and it was um, a really nice thing to do so we had Rebecca, who's our research historian um, and speaking today. Susan, who has volunteered all the coordinators and has also um, coordinated all the volunteers and is also speaking today. Um, Laura helped with the um, uh, art, art workshops that we held at New River College Primary and helped procure our artists to lead those workshops. Um, and Chris, who is one of our volunteers, has, is also a um, designer for the project. So it's been um, a fantastic team. And we've worked with a number of local partners, including Islington Guided Walks, the Islington Society, the Museum and History Centre and New River College. And identifying and working with local partners has also made this a fantastic project and was really strongly recommended because we've managed to create so much more out of it than I think we would have done otherwise. So these were our original project outputs. We wanted to research the history of the building. We wanted to recruit around 25 volunteers to help research um, the history of the people buried in the crypt. Um, we wanted to develop two guided historical walks, one for adults and one for children. Uh, hold three public talks, three workshops, which this is the first of. Um, we wanted to recruit 10 volunteers to help curate a three month exhibition at Islington Museum. And I'll just put a little flag in there to say, um, although the exhibition was put up at Islington Museum, it closed just as lockdown started and it will be relocating to the South Isle of the Cloudsea Centre at the end of September. Um, so hopefully people will have an opportunity to pop in and have a look um, if you're able and uh, that will be details about that um, are on the LDF website and uh, I'm afraid because it's volunteer manned it will be Saturday mornings only. Um, one of the most fantastic parts about this project was working with New River College Primary School and um, supporting the children with their learning through art workshops and just helping them engage in, um, in the project and understand a little bit more about the history of the area and what it would have been like to uh, live back in um, the, the early sort of 1800s. And I think um, it's something that everybody has very much benefited from and enjoyed as the project has developed. Um, and yes, all of the research findings and uh, papers are or will be going on the LDF website. So if anybody wants to have a look and a read and understand more, then they're up there. So this project um, received significant funding from the National Lottery Heritage Fund and as such we had to sit down and brainstorm the outcomes that the HLF were um, asking us to look at, which ones were the most important and which ones we thought we could um, deliver most effectively. So um, you can see here the outcomes that we identified 
we, Rebecca's research was used to help inform the conservation management plan, um, meaning the heritage will be better managed in the future. Um, the building was, will be better interpreted and explained, and that has most definitely been the case with the volunteer research and the exhibition that will be going up through um, in the building shortly. And we are sharing our learning from the project through these legacy workshops. Um, the heritage will be better recorded uh, is with all the research being freely available to anybody who wants to have a look on the LDF website and people will have developed skills. We identified that we would recruit about 35 volunteers um, and that we were slightly down on numbers, but we were very pleased with the number of volunteers that we worked with. It was definitely in the region of 20 to 30, but Susan will give you more information. And then we worked with um, up to, I think it was 24 young people um, from the art workshops, but uh, it, it was up to 24, it varied in number. Um, we've had people volunteering their time. Um, I'm very much, uh, certainly I have had a very enjoyable experience and I'm sure a lot of other people have too. We've been doing um, feedback from the volunteers and hopefully feedback from anybody else who's engaged with the project. Um, uh, a wider range of people will have engaged with heritage and we've managed to recruit local volunteers from all ages, which is fantastic, students, people who are retired, um, from all parts of the Islington community by working with um, local community groups. So it's been a very broad and engaging um, project and that's been brilliant because that's part of the Heritage Fund's um, overall aim. Um, and hopefully um, with our walking tours, communities might have a better quality of life through uh, walking and just understanding more about their local area. So we feel that we've touched on a huge number of the HLF outcomes, which is uh, really important. So I just thought I'd um, throw up a few photographs of uh, some of our volunteers learning about uh, the building. Um, this is an image of one of the pupils participating in the art workshops at New River College. And um, then if we just move on quickly to the timeline, because it's important that people understand how long these sorts of projects take to develop. So we took approximately three months consulting with local partners, trying to see how they might be engaged, um, how, want, how they might want to get um, involved in the project. Um, and I'd say we took about a month then, once we'd firmed up our ideas to develop and write the application and submit it to the lottery. Um, sorry, to submit the project inquiry form. We then um, got a response back saying that yes, uh, we, that seemed like a sensible proposal. So we took a little bit longer to develop the application. Um, and ideally it's best not to rush an application so that you can make it as detailed and as relevant as possible. Um, because this was a, a smaller grant, um, it didn't need to go to a uh, grants committee as such. Um, it was looked at by um, a smaller group of HLF staff and we received our reward letter uh, after six weeks of submitting the application. Um, did take a little while to secure permission to start, but that generally tends to be the way. Um, and because of COVID-19, the 18 month delivery program will be pushed out by a further three months. So the total time frame is sort of two and a half, two and three quarter years. In terms of our funding, the total project costs to pay for the consultant time, um, expenses, uh, printing the exhibition, um, artists, time, came to just over £58,000. The lottery awarded us a grant of £46,000, which was fantastic. Um, the diocese matched that with just over £6,000, and we also secured a um, grant from the Mayor of London through their Culture Seeds Fund of £5,000. 
So that's how we managed to pull together the total project costs. Um, and I think the only sort of tip I would put in about developing a budget is it's very important to put in a contingency because things always change and sometimes um, you forget to put something in. So it's really helpful just to have a little contingency to pull from if you need to. So that's really the background to the Tales from the Crypt project. Um, and so I then wanted uh, to give everybody just a chance to flag up any questions before we move on. Have any questions come through chat? No, we don't have any in the chat. So um, unless, oh, we do have a, a question from, from Hazel. Hazel, if you just want to unmute yourself, perfect. Hi. Um, hi, uh, uh, hi. Uh, apologies for my ignorance, but I, I'm, I'm taking it this church isn't in use as no. a church. Sorry, no. So uh, the building is actually a closed church. So it was closed to Anglican worship back in the 70s. Oh, right. And um, it was leased out, but that lease... Um, came to an end in 2017. Um, so since then, the responsibility for the building has fallen back on the Diocese of London rather than the local parish. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any further questions? Yes, um, there's one question in the chat room from Emily. Emily, okay. do you want to say your question? Would you want to read it out, Becky? No, I, I can read it out if that's helpful. Yeah, that might be more helpful. Um, so it says, was anything spent on capital costs or was it solely heritage activities? What are the plans for repairing the building? So when we first went to the HLF and we had a discussion with them about the building, our original plan was to go in and ask for a capital grant to repair, um, to repair the building and to reuse it for office and community space. Um, however, the HLF turned around and they said that they weren't convinced that we were in the right place to put in a capital grant uh, application on the project. And this is quite a common response now from the lottery. They tend to want to work with you on a project um, as a project partner and give you a smaller grant in the first instance to work out what you want to do with the building, to engage with the community, to make sure you have um, full community support before you then set out on a much larger capital project. So we were given that advice and we were told to um, uh, develop a, a community-led project researching and looking at the heritage of the building. Um, and that is why we came up with the Tales from the Crypt project, because we felt that that was a very interesting part of the project, looking at the stories of the people who were buried in the crypt. Um, and we also wanted to understand more about the building itself and how it had uh, first been designed, built, and then um, changed and adapted over the years. So there were a number of elements um, and then we looked at as I said the various project partners um, who we could work with in the local community who was interested and who we could we could help most so New River College was a particularly um, a key partner for us because um, the primary school is a, a pupil referral unit and therefore the children that go there um, tend to obviously uh, have, some have education needs, some have a difficult home lives, so they need more support and um, working with them was extraordinary and uh, one of the best parts of the project, I would have said. So um, uh, I, I think that, uh, and I've always found this with the lottery, that their advice that they give you always helps create a better project in the long run. And I would absolutely agree with this in this instance. Um, so now we are looking at uh, a capital project. We are in a much better and stronger place to do that because we've now made really good, strong local links that we can 
rely on in the future. Um, and we have a much better understanding about the building and how we might go about adapting it um, and reusing it. So although it's added an extra couple of years to the project timeline, um, you know, we've not sat um, around. We have secured a historic England funding for extremely urgent repairs to the building because we were worried that the arm roofs were about to literally fall in. Um, and so that has meant that securing historic England funding has, has helped us repair those arm roofs and to take away the immediate risk of part of the building collapsing. Um, so we, we sort of run it in, in tandem. And um, although at the moment we clearly can't put uh, a lottery application in, I'm hoping we will be able to work one up um, in the early part of 2021. Um, I think Gareth had a question. Oh, Gareth, you have to unmute yourself. Gareth, you have to unmute. No, I've, I've unmuted him, it's fine. Okay. Oh, thank you. Um, no, I think that my, um, I was originally going to ask about the 58,000 in relation to the capital project, but that's been answered. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. So that fifty-eight thousand was purely for activities, nothing yes. to do with capital costs. Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Um, I see we had another question. How much was the HE funding? So we managed to secure a grant um, to repair the arm roofs um, of five hundred and fourteen thousand pounds, and that was at sixty-six uh, percent match funding. We want to um, move on now. Um, yes, if, if that's okay. Um, there are no more questions. I would like to welcome uh, Rebecca. Um, and Rebecca was our research historian on the project. Um, and she's going to tell us how she went about researching the archives so that you can um, take that knowledge away, hopefully, and potentially do the same for your own buildings. Shall I start screen, sh screen sharing now? Can yes, you if you me? could, Rebecca. Tell me if it works. Will do. It can be a bit slow to begin with. Yep. And then if you just want to see your presentation like a normal slide show, perfect. Excellent. Wonderful. That's good. Yep. Um, good to see you all. Um, now, I'm sure that um, at least some of what I'm going to say this morning will be familiar to many of you, but I hope that you'll come away with some new ideas. Um, I'm mostly concerned here with how to research the building of your church um, and the land it stands on, but the example should also highlight how um, some of the same records can tell us about people, uh, most obviously those involved in founding and building a church, but also parishioners. And it will link with what I'll talk about um, a bit later on this morning, on understanding your building and its place in the community um, in the past and the present. We're using Holy Trinity as a case study um, because I work for the Diocese of London. Um, what I have to say may seem rather focused on Greater London. And likewise, what I have to say is relates primarily to the Church of England, um, but which may suit you fine, I don't know. But in each case, much of the research process should hold good, whatever, um, wherever your building is located and whatever denomination or faith it serves or served in the past. So uh, what resources are available? What might you find in an archive? Um, what collections are useful? Before you start on primary research, there are a number of things you can check um, that will help you see what research has already been done, and, and to help set the scene. These include the online Historic England uh, list entry. There is one on the left, um, which often contain a wealth of information and the Church of England uh, Church Heritage Database, um, a screenshot of which is on the right. Um, and these entries are for St Andrew Sudbury, where we had originally planned to be today, back in March. Conservation area appraisals and local list entries um, all usually available online through the council website can also be useful. 
online planning decisions via the local author authority planning portal um, can also be really revealing about change over time. And, and some authorities include digitised drawings and entries going back a couple of decades. And just Googling generally can bring up local history reports and surveys, um, including conservation area assessments and so on. I would have begun with online resources anyway, but of course they're all the more crucial at the moment. There is an awful lot you can do from home with internet access, and some local authority and national libraries are offering free access to digital collections that you'd normally um, need to pay for or have institutional subscriptions to see. The Institute of Historical Research website has a good, um, though not exhaustive list of what's currently available remotely, and at the end of um, the presentation, I'll put a lot of links um, to these databases and websites, so don't worry about them now. However, primar primary research in physical archives, investigation of historic documents and images, is normally essential if you want to make sure you found out everything possible about your church building. This can not only reveal new information about a building's history, but also bring to light themes which could form the basis of a community project. Your local library will likely have books and articles tracing the history um, of local places of worship, but today I'm mainly looking at primary sources, uh, records created at the time. The first port of call for researching primary archives, um, primary sources for your church or other building, is usually the local authority archive. Local authority archives are invaluable repositories of material records, but just as importantly, they employ archivists and sometimes volunteers who will know their collections and the local area very well. So archives contain knowledge as well as things. But before you contact an archive or make a visit, I'd suggest doing some homework first. Check to see um, if the archives you think you will need to visit have digital catalogues or a PDF hand list, and if so, look to see um, how these archives are organised and how much information is contained in the catalogue entry. I usually begin by making lists of what each archive has catalogued online, together with the references. Um, material can be in several places, often perhaps. And then paste these entries into a chronological list. Even without viewing the original documents, this can help build a picture of the sequence of works or, or blocks of works to a church building or to a churchyard. And when access is possible again, then the information can be summarized or transcribed into the same document. And I always transcribe documents at this stage and um, summarize any changes shown in photographs or drawings. And I thought I'd look a bit um, close, more closely at images and maps uh, later this morning. As we were due to be in Brent, um, I've included a slide of the Borough Archives website. And as you can see, the catalogue has several strands, a museum collection, images and archives. And the catalogue takes you straight away to some very nice digitised postcards of St Andrew, but also to references to building plans, which are invaluable to understanding your building and some articles in the local history journal. So in this case, some material can be viewed immediately, while other sources you'll need to make an appointment to view uh, once that's possible. Not every local authority or private archive has an online catalogue, however. If an archive doesn't have one, its holdings may be summarised or itemised um, on the National Archives digital catalogue seen here, um, called Discovery. You go to the advanced search option and type in the name of the archive, which it will recognise if there is any content. And of course, you can do general searches of discovery. Because records, as I've already said, are not necessarily all in the same place, um, this is a good way of finding out where they might be. Play around with catalogue searching, but in general I find, and I'm sorry if I'm teaching grandmothers to suck eggs here, um, minimal search terms are best initially and try with and without apostrophes. I avoid using saint because of multiple styles and full stops. Um, all the files for St Andrew on this catalogue um, to take this example, are at London Metropolitan Archives, except one, um, which, um, because it relates to an educational charity, is within the educational files at the National Archives itself. 
an important point is to find out the names by which your church was originally known. It may always have been the same, but if you are looking to search in physical newspapers or via digital collections of newspapers, um, this is the British Newspaper Archive, um, you'll find more hits if you are using the same terms as were commonly used, especially when it was first built. For example, coming back to the Cloudsley Centre, searching for combinations of chapel and Islington or church and Cloudsley brought up more references than just the church's formal names of Holy Trinity um, Cloudsley Square or Holy Trinity Islington. And in fact, the word holy wasn't used at all much to start with. And look out for changes in road name or area. Cloudsley Square was initially called Islington Square. So spending some time with maps and newspapers can help both to broaden and to narrow your search terms. To take another example, this time in central London, uh, the Church of St Mary Le Strand uh, was commonly known as the New Church in the Strand for well over a hundred years after it was first proposed at the turn of the 18th century. Doing newspaper searches like this can be fiddly, um, but it helps to understand the context of when and why the church was built, who designed and built it, and its relationship to the parish. And it's much quicker than searching hard copies or microfilm and can be done at home with a cup of tea. Provided that is that the database includes your local paper or your building is likely to be included um, in the national or major regional uh, newspaper. Use double inverted commas for short phrases. Um, and if you find you've too many hits to sort through, um, you can narrow your search again um, by date. And there are various search options on the left. You'll soon identify key periods of interest um, and then you can search more carefully. Uh, you will most probably need to pay for access to this database unless you're within the British Library, uh, but you can do so for shorter or longer periods. And, I don't like to advertise things, but I've found this very useful over the years when I can't get to archives. Searches of the London Metropolitan Archives catalogue for Greater London, including areas formerly in the county of Middlesex, can be done at the same time. Um, and you can see here that there are a couple of hundred items for a simple search of Holy Trinity Cloudy Square. Um, so in this case, I decided to start with what looked to be the most promising documents to try to understand the key changes to the church and work through the rest of the documents later. If you are researching an Anglican church, among the most important records you will want to find are faculties. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with these, faculty papers are a sort of ecclesiastical planning permission, which should hopefully survive from the 19th century, if, if not before, for changes to anything on, on consecrated ground. Um, that's the bur burial space and the removal of bodies as well as church fabric and they have to be agreed by the relevant bishop. They often contain before and after drawings as here and sometimes detailed specifications of works and can tell us who the architect and builder was. These are drawings for the reorganisation of the interior of Holy Trinity um, in 1912 and they show the removal of the galleries in the aisles and several other changes. However, um, faculties are permissive documents rather than prescriptive ones. So not all or any of the work cited or depicted may have been completed. Um, I'll come back to this later, but you need to check proposals for work against records of executed works and to use the full range of, of sources available and the evidence of the building itself to work out what was actually built. If you're lucky, specifications for works will be with the faculty or, in this case, um, with other parish records. And you'll probably still need additional documentation to prove what work was done. Another kind of record invaluable for understanding your church are vestry minutes in church wardens' accounts, not usually available online, sadly. Vestries were formed of local people and, until secular powers, um, were taken over by parish and borough councils from the 1890s. Um, vestries were resp responsible for local government as well as ecclesiastical matters. And so they reveal the church's place at the heart of the community. Uh, these are sample pages of the vestry minutes for Holy Trinity at Belle M.A. on the left, um, and the vestry minutes for St Mary Islington, which are Islington heritage on the right. 
Um, they contain information about vestrymen and parishioners, as well as the building and burial spaces. And they're a good source um, of stories for developing into particular themes centered on the church, but also encom um, encompassing very real human stories from the parish. And to take just one example, in 1825, the St. Mary Islington Vestry authorized the payment of 10 guineas to the constables for their attendances at the New River Company last year to prevent indecent bathing. So there are some lighthearted stories amongst the um, serious church matters. Holy Trinity was a chapel of ease, a secondary place of worship in an expanding parish. And another way that we tracked progress to Holy Trinity was by searching the bundles of partly catalogued material held within the records of the Mother Church and St Mary. I photographed this bundle as a reminder of how large it was, that this documents what happened at the opening of the church, and include it um, as a reminder for you to hang on to your photography form so that you have a record of what you saw and to assist with filing. And I should say that um, these forms don't permit you to share um, the images from the archives in any form. Um, it's um, just so they know what you photographed. Now, you didn't come here for a lecture on filing today, but it's sensible to file your images with its reference code and any notes that you made at the time. Uh, this is part of my folder of my Holy Trinity archival material for my own reference. If you are taking lots of photographs, which speeds up the research process no end, then help yourself out, out and mark things that catch your eye. Uh, my hand here is pointing to a relatively large sum for works in 1939 so that I could follow it up later to see what it might have covered. But on reading the payments at home more carefully, it also showed small sums paid for summer excursions and a Christmas treat for children in what was now a, a really poor area. So careful reading of seemingly mundane records um, could suggest um, themes or ideas for community-based projects. So don't be disheartened is what I'm saying if your records look pretty thin. I thought I'd quickly show you the small civilian night patrol book now at London Metropolitan Archives that was found in the crypt at Holy Trinity by a church warden. It tells us who was on patrol during the First World War in the Zeppelin raids, sometimes where they lived locally, um, and it indicates that some were either very young or had trouble with writing and spelling. They were also evidently having a bit of a laugh. It was a dark and stormy night, reads one, and another notes he was woken by cats, and another just reads starry night, cold feet. So they're not much use as a record of the weather, but they do contain the threads of potentially interesting social stories about the parish. And it also tells us that the crypt was used um, as an air raid shelter, which we were keen to know more about. Parish magazines and similar church publications are a good source of local parish news, fundraising imperatives and images. In our case, they confirmed that 1,700 people, including babies and children, sheltered nightly beneath the church during Zeppelin raids in World War I. And the images here revealed that they were still using the old entrance to the crypt. Um, records at London Metropolitan Archives and the National Archives can be pre-ordered online once um, archives have opened, which I believe they have now. But in most other cases, you will need to email with a list of what you would like to see and to make an appointment to visit when they open. Um, this is a list from the Church of England Records Centre. Um, I dare say this is all pretty self-explanatory, but I just find it helpful to be very specific about what I'd like to order before asking archivists about anything um, I might have missed. So to sum up, um, I hope I've shown some of the ways in which you can put together a list of records relating to works to your place of worship. And hopefully um, so you can start on transcriptions to some of the um, physical records themselves. This working document can form the basis for understanding your building and its significance and needs, um, which is the topic of my talk um, after our break this morning. So I'll stop there. Um, any questions? If not, we can... Great, Rebecca. Thank you very much. Shall I? There are some on chat. There are, there are three questions. Let me just stop. Shall I close the presentation? Yeah, you, you can stop just screen sharing.
Good. Um, yeah, Christine Bartlett asked, um, how can we access faculty records? Um, where is your church? Hillingdon. Hillingdon. They, if they survive, and it's, it's um, they don't always, and it's hit, certainly hit and miss. What, what date is your church? Oh, it's medieval. Um, and it's, that's, that's the Diocese for London still, isn't it? Yes, yes. They should be at London Metropolitan Archives, but very often um, preliminary papers leading up to the, the granting of the faculty will be with the local authority archive. So it's worth checking with both. Um, and the other place that related papers may be is Lambeth Palace Library. So not usually the faculties themselves, but correspondence surrounding it. So those three places would be my first port of call. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the Metro London Metropolitan Archives catalogue, it's a bit fiddly. Um, rather boring detail about searches. Um, you will eventually find a sequence of faculties if they survive. Um, and, and that list of dates can be very useful. But I, I, I've not seen faculties before the 18th century, and I've only seen a couple of those. So I wouldn't hold up much hope for earlier than that. Thank you. Um, Christine, you also asked whether Cloudsley Square was connected with Sir Cloudsley Shovel. Um, I more? believe not, having looked at long um, Twitter conversations about this. Um, this is to do with the donor of the land um, who was and, and Susan can talk more about this probably um, because her volunteers were looking into this. Okay. Um, so I think the answer is no, although it's an unusual name. So maybe at some level they were. Okay, thank you. Um, Gareth, you, ha you had a question about, you wanted suggestions for researching your church, which is listed grade one and dates from 1395. Gareth, do you want to say where your church is? Um, our church is in Maidstone in Kent. It's the parish church and um, is in the dire state. Um, well, I'm talking to you from Kent today. Um, I would start with um, the county record office, which is in Maidstone, isn't it? I'm afraid I don't know if it's open yet, but I imagine the archives. Probably not. The archives may still be working. Um, I would think they could tell you immediately what they had um, and if they don't, where it might be. But as with the previous question, Lambeth Palace Library Archives Catalogue. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about images after the, our break. But they, there are part of Lambeth Palace Library's catalogue um, is called Luna, which is an image database. And that does have some images related to particular grants. So it, it partly depends on um, whether that is applicable to your church. So those are, that, that's where I would start. Um, and, and again, Discovery, the National Archives catalogue. Unfortunately, they don't always say faculty or faculty papers on the catalogue. London Metropolitan Archive, so it's a tricky one. Um, Thank you. Good luck. Yeah, we need a lot of that. Any other questions? That was that was all from the chat room. Um, I can't see any. I think we can move on to Susan then. Okay, smashing. Um, so Susan is going to talk to everybody about how we worked with and engaged our local community. And Susan is a heritage consultant um, with, I was going to say a historical background, but a, a broad background um, in working with heritage projects. Susan, you have to unmute. Sorry. Are you having a problem? 
No? Yeah. yeah. Okay, apologies for this. Um, let me just go back through the slideshow. Um, Okay, I was trying to do two things at once, which is obviously a bad idea. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, it's lovely to be speaking uh, in front of you all. Uh, shame not to be in person because um, I'm talking about people and community. And I think it's one of the things that is going to take a very big hit from our current situation. And I'd be interested to know what your thoughts are at the end of this, if we have any time for questions. Um, because it feels quite a historic activity engaging your community in person. Right, to begin with, um, we've heard a bit about the church and the key thing in terms of community, it's a closed church. So your pre-existing community, which I hope all of you that I'm speaking to, uh, you have people who are either worshippers, supporters, uh, volunteers already. Um, this project started uh, about a year ago without really having any natural community other than the people who lived around the church and looked at its sorry state. So I want to start really by saying thinking who is your community? I presume you have a pre-existing one but don't stop there just think about how can you reach out to new people. Um, it's wonderful to have a project for people to get stuck into, to have the opportunity to get involved in something locally and I don't want to sound completely like the mouthpiece for the lottery fund, but we do need to think beyond our perhaps comfort zone and include people that who aren't natural volunteers or existing volunteers, not people you've met before. And it's a wonderful opportunity to bring people together. Um, I think sometimes uh, projects are conceived quite around small tables and the opportunity to throw out, uh, throw yourself open to having new voices and new commitment from people is, you know, a project is the perfect idea. As I say, we had to start from scratch um, and it proved a really interesting experience. So here's some how to's. I'm sort of going through these slides to think about why we want to engage the community, but also some nuts and bolts. And um, forgive me if I'm uh, preaching to the converted and this is all incredibly familiar with you. Um, oh, sorry, I keep, switching slides here. Oh, goodness me, sorry. That's the one I want. Um, apologies, I can't go back through this. Right, that's too much on the trigger. So here's some how to engage your community. So. These are the opportunities that uh, we found useful in the Clousy project, but in other projects I've worked for. So when you consult local people and perhaps woo project partners, listen to their thoughts, how would they like to be involved? Design your project to benefit the building and people. So think of both things in mind. The repairs are very uh, uh, obviously to the front of your mind, but how can we involve people? It's not just about bricks and mortar. Fundraising for your project. People want to help. Um, they want to get involved, they want to help trigger more money and more interest, and they'll have creative ideas of how you might be able to do this. Obviously, publicising the project, we were very fortunate to have the Islington Gazette, a thriving local newspaper on board, and we're happy to do a double page spread about this project, which obviously brought in more interest um, and made it possible for people to get involved. Recruit volunteers. Um, we were lucky to work with a number of project partners, as Rosie has outlined, um, but people are incredibly open. And um, even though we had a very short time scale, uh, the Islington Society were happy to promote what we were doing to recruit volunteers and also um, invited me to say a few words at a talk they were giving. So put yourself out there, speak to people, go to meetings, meet new groups and, and say what you're doing. Um, Obviously, sharing your outcomes with the wider community, that goes in how you design the heritage activities you want to deliver, um, and um, uh, very much thinking of how you can reach different age groups, in our case, obviously working with the primary school, but obviously looking at um, exhibition, which might be visited people um, of, of, of all different backgrounds. Evaluate your experience of the volunteers and project with um, project partners. Um, that's obviously another way of 
bringing the community in um, and then finally the celebrate bit which um, unfortunately hasn't been possible uh, in any shape or form on this project um, but hopefully we can celebrate through delivering these activities together. So the research, first of all, we had a team of research volunteers who investigated these tales from the crypt. So essentially there are 178 people buried in the crypt and we wanted to find out who those people were. I've included a slide of literally all the information we had, name, address, date of burial, age, and who buried them. And here we are, I've talked about, we've got a closed church, so no existing community. But essentially what our volunteers were trying to do was piece together who was the past community? Which is, a, again, this is all around people, dare I say it, both uh, deceased people and a very vibrant community now. So how did we deliver um, uh, the, 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 the skills and um, training that volunteers needed? We worked with Islington Archives to, um, a to deliver a series of workshops where we got really good attendance. We got around 30 people coming to those. Um, and then those who were able to commit the time uh, to investigating people in detail, they were mentored by myself on a, by email and by going to uh, archives together and for me to go through how you might research these people. Those of you are familiar with, doing with family, de dealing with family research, a lot of the, the things we were learning were about using family research documents, using ancestry online, but also here in Islington archives using the photographs and most importantly things like rate books which were a unique surviving document listing all the people who pay taxes at this time when Clousey Square was being um, occupied. So understanding past lives was um, the pre preeminent thing we were trying to do, piecing together the details of the lives who were buried in the crypt um, and here this is a very lovely moment where one of our volunteers um, discovers the grave up in Highgate Cemetery of um, some of the relations of people who were at, of the family she was researching in the crypt, um, literally uncovering it, which I think is a, a very eloquent image of this is where research gets you. Sharing knowledge. This is another part of our trip to Highgate Cemetery. Uh, I should make clear the crypt at Cloudsley Square is totally closed off no public access and it was really never intended to be a place of mourning. Um, so one of the places we visited was Highgate Cemetery to find where one of the people who had been buried in the crypt was actually taken out of the crypt and reburied in Highgate Cemetery so that her husband would be buried with her. And here I think is the lovely example of um, volunteers sharing the information about these past lives with each other. Um, and the illumination, I know it's a very obvious visual cue, but um, the illumination this brought to everyone um, was both educational and rewarding. Um, so moving on to the exhibition, because we recruited another set of uh, volunteers, some of whom overlapped uh, with the research volunteers, to create a small uh, exhibition in Islington uh, Museum and local archives. And here's one of the three workshops which uh, the curator at Islington Museum delivered. And back to training, because obviously the research skills that the volunteers learned were very different set of skills from the actual, how do we put on an exhibition that will draw in people and be of interest um, beyond uh, the people that are actually doing the research. So we've got some brainstorming, caption writing, and then actually setting up the exhibition. Um, and if I, if you forgive me for a moment, this is quite a poignant image because, of course, the exhibition lasted all of one and a half days before COVID hit. So um, you're getting a rare insight into an exhibition that hopefully will repurpose in the Clousey Centre. Wellbeing. Now, this runs through all projects and is very much something that uh, those of you who've looked into lottery funding, will be very aware that this is a high priority. Um, and forgive the image, it's, it's a fantastic uh, moment when we went to visit the sister church of Holy Trinity up in Upper Holloway, um, St. John's Upper Holloway, and guess what we found on the gallery? Um, our volunteer Derek here couldn't resist sitting in it. Um, I wouldn't say it's been a doddle, this project for the volunteers. They've worked incredibly hard, given a lot of their time. Um, 
but I think it's been something that has generated more interest. The more they've given, the more they've got out of it. But I've just pulled together some of the things that I think is very useful to be mindful of throughout your project planning. What do we people want to get out of it? Obviously, we've got learning new skills, enjoying new experiences, forging new friendships, boosting self-confidence. Now, this is one that I really rate highly because our volunteers got to do things they wouldn't normally do. They stepped outside their comfort zone. Um, and I think they really gained from that in many ways. Obviously, it encouraged intergenerational contact, specifically through the exhibition uh, curators, who were definitely of um, very different age groups and experiences. And that was lovely to have the chat following on from that. Um, taking pride in shared achievements. And then finally, connecting with place. Now, this is very topical, I think, at the moment, and people living more locally, but these volunteers very much connected with um, the history and heritage of, and the people of where, where they were living, um, splendid. Um, and this is an equally vital outcome, I think, and reason why we engage these wonderful people. Um, all the volunteers who have worked for the project have become brilliant ambassadors for the building and are really committed to seeing it being brought back into use. After all, it's, it's, it's empty at the moment, and obviously this can't be brought out into, back into use without major capital works, but um, we need people to help this as well. So I've put here, allowing people to have a direct connection with the building helps create, strengthen, and diversify the community, which will look after it in the future. Um, and I think forward planning is, is essential for that. Um, this was another happenstance. Kieran here just found this hanging around in the, the gallery. So just look around your church. There might be bits finding you find. Um, so I've just, my final slide is just to say, here's some inspiring examples of engagement elsewhere. I'd be interested in any you have to share, but uh, one in St Pancras Old Church Camden, um, where they've continued to have a historical presence. Um, they, they've repurposed the church as well as um, providing worship. It has a wonderful series of concerts and talks. Uh, St. Helen Eskrit, which is a fantastic um, heritage um, uh, effort from across the community, highlighting lots of different aspects of the heritage. And finally, a non-church one, but Beckham Street State Dagenham, it has a series of extraordinary um, uh, projects, mostly funded by the lottery, um, and I just think their wealth of experience and the, the range of things they're doing are, are really worth looking at and, and what keeping an eye on. So apologies for the technical hash up that I've provided, but please, any questions or comments, I'd be delighted to take them. Susan, can you stop screen sharing in the first instance? Yep. There aren't um, any questions in the chat room. So. It's anyone want to raise their hands? No, there are, there are. There are two questions in the chat oh, room. Oh, sorry, I missed them. The one says, will we be able to access this workshop later? Um, that's yes, I'll put <coughs> according in the slides up on the LDF website um, and Becky will send you out a link so you know where to go to. Um, and, oh. So the second question, your church is now closed. You've referred to previous plans which have been shelved. Where do you see the future of your church now? Um, gosh, I think that's more of a me question than a Susan. Can I, can I just say that um, I think, just to point them out, I think it, one of the aspects is it has been very hard to get over the, the lack of building to, to bring volunteers together in. People have had to get over this sort of um, a barrier of there being no church open, no place to bring people to to congregate. You have always had to have faith that there will be a building back open to welcome back the community. And that's my, um, that's the feedback from the volunteers. They really are invested in making this happen before Rosie explains how that might happen. If that's okay for me to put that in there. No, absolutely. So, um, I, all I would say is that one of our use options is being reconsidered. So originally we were looking at office and community space. Um, we are now perhaps thinking about educational and community space in the building. 
but more more importantly or perhaps interestingly um, once we have repaired the aisle roofs we are looking at potentially trying to repair the nave ceiling and that will mean that uh, the interior of the building the main body of the church will then be safe to enter um, and we're looking at potential meanwhile uses um, We've been approached from a couple of architects firms to use the space and um, we've also been approached by somebody who manages artist studios to let artists rent the space. Um, that would be in, on an interim basis over the next two to three years while we fundraise for uh, the main capital works. But our plan is to get people, even if it's short term, into that building as soon as possible. Um. The point is I was trying to get at was, it being a closed church, um, you obviously have no intention of bringing it back as an ecclesiastical building. It's going to be a community space. Yes, it is. Um, I mean, the, the building um, is no longer consecrated for Anglican worship. Ah, right. However, the crypt is still a consecrated space because of the burials down there. Mm -hmm. Um, and that will always remain a consecrated yeah. space. Um, so, you know, you know realistically, um, you know, we do sort of need to stress it should technically no longer be seen as a church. It, you know, it is no longer a place of worship. So it is a building and we need to find new uses for it. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I think trying to put a meanwhile use in and putting the exhibition in um, even if it is Saturday mornings only, will hopefully be a really good start at letting people yeah. come back in. This to some extent is the quandary that we have in that um, um, All Saints in Maidstone is, is our church. It's also the parish church, Maidstone being the county town. But we're also going to have to, having to think of ways of combining that with some community use and not easy. Well, yes, I mean, uh, when you're looking at mixed use, you always need to be um, mindful uh, as, to, as to how to manage the building. But um, originally we were looking at having office space during the day and then community uses in the evening um, and at the weekends. So we were speaking to um, an organisation who are happy to have that split and to share the space accordingly. So it's all about being open up front with your expectations with okay. other people with other people yeah. Oh, yeah 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 with partners yes thank you. Yeah. thank you susan i see a, a question has popped in through chat yeah um to... and it's thank you for the question how to how we attracted volunteers um primarily uh the lead thing was the islington gazette article which promoted the lottery award which was a good news story um we that did a has, call to volunteers in it, didn't we? We also did a call to volunteers, which went out on social media as well as on the London Diocese uh, website. Um, but also there were um, opportunities for me to go and talk at um, the Islington Society talk. The lecture, I piggybacked off their lecture and just was allowed five minutes. Um, and also our call for volunteers was put in um, with another newsletter, historical newsletter for the Archaeology and History Society. The timing was very apt because if I can say, we were on a really tight deadline. It seems strange now because COVID hitting and everything, but May to September, we had five months in which to deliver um, volunteer research. Um, I think, and I hope Rosie won't tick me off for this, try and plan ahead more so that you're not so much, uh, oh, how can we jump back off other people's backs if you can organise a public event um, to recruit volunteers and tell people how um, to, uh, what will be involved. What I should say is I also had four drop-in sessions at the local library and archives and at a neighbouring church at their coffee morning where I basically set up, come and meet me, have a chat about what's involved and I could either persuade people or people realise, actually, I don't have time for this, but I had made contact and there are people who we will go back to when we do the next phase. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, 
Are there any more questions? Okay, if not, um, we've done the first session this morning. We have a break now until 11.15. Um, the easiest way for everybody to do that is just to turn your screens off and mute and then come back um, at 11.15 and we'll start up again. And that means you don't need to log in and out of the Zoom and the Zoom session will be running. I will, however, uh, press pause on the recording so that it's not a boring half an hour wait. Um, <laughs> so if that's okay, if everybody wants to just do that and I'll see you all back at 11.15. Um, right, well, we're at quarter past 11, so hopefully everybody is back and has grabbed a cup of coffee and dealt with emails and done everything. Um, we have got three more presentations to go, and we will hopefully finish this session at half past 12, um, which hopefully is good timing. So our next presentation is hearing from Rebecca again about um, understanding your building. And um, uh, that will be using quite a bit about Holy Trinity to help. Does that look okay? That looks perfect. Shame we're blocking out part of the church, but never mind. <laughs> Rosie. And hello again, everybody. Um, we talked this morning about how you can undertake research so as to better understand uh, your church building. What I want to do now is to show some of the visual sources, maps and images, which can help us with understanding your church better and also to think about why it's important to understand your church. And at the end, I'll touch on what significance is, um, how to identify it and how uh, and by what means. Now, although what I have to say relates mainly to churches and church records dating from about 1700 um, or just before, it should also be relevant to those of you researching much older properties. The very fact that a church has been standing for, say, 500 or 1,000 years will mean that it will have seen many, many changes or additions to the fabric in order to maintain it, to repair it after fire um, or other damage. Um, for instance, in the Second World War, to adapt it in response to changes in religious practice and for more prosaic reasons, such as improved heating, acoustics or security. Whatever the age of a church, these are important records in themselves, but they'll also um, often tell you about the building before it was altered. And some records, such as the vestry minutes and church wardens accounts that um, I showed you this morning, will often contain references to earlier events at the church, either for antiquarian interest or because they are legal documents which relate to the founding and funding of a church or the land it stands on and, and perhaps also to glebe land and other property. I talked a little this morning about the difference between records showing proposed works and those recording uh, what was actually done. Some of this will be obvious from looking at the building now, um, but not always. Um, and there are, I should say, specific types of document which record completed works, um, which I can come back to in questions, but they don't always contain much detail. But the overall point to stress here is that all your sources should corroborate each other to help build a picture of changes, um, which you can then use to observe the building more carefully with your own eyes. Rules about where burials could take place within um, and outside a church may also change from when proposed and when opened and change again over time. Vestry minutes and the burial books, which are sometimes included in these, can give a good indication of the organization of burials over time. These can tell us not just about the presence of human remains, but also the form of the vaults or crypt, which is crucial to understanding your building, um, especially if this is no longer accessible. Many vaults in central London were cleared in the second half of the 19th century and the remains moved to outlying cemeteries. And I found that where no faculty papers appear to survive for this, there are sometimes other ways to 
find out what happened um, from documentation available online. Um, and again, I can talk about that in questions if it's relevant to anybody. I won't talk about genealogy websites today, but for those of you interested in burials and burial spaces, some parish burial records, um, sadly not Holy Trinity, um, available on Ancestry, give the location of um, interment as well as dates and names. This one is for St Michael Paternoster Royal in the City of London and records where in the church vaults and churchyard parishioners and non-parishioners were buried um, in the 17th century. Uh, here we have, for example, um, um, just one of the entries, William Throckmorton, who was interred at the upper end of the South Isle. And recording all of these, you get a picture of who was buried where and when. Um, and that was on the 18th of March, 1667, the first burial since the fire of London um, in March 16, 1666, in September, excuse me, 1666. And I particularly like this run of pages because it shows how the pattern of burial was affected by the fire and also by the building of Christopher Wren's church on the same footprint. But the degree of detail given in burial registers is highly variable between churches and also between the individuals who made the entries. Moving on to images now, um, alongside collecting documentary evidence from archival material, my usual working practice is, practice is to collect, in inverted commas, as many visual records as I can of the exterior, interior, and, and also a sequence of maps and plans. And once compiled, this is a simple way of seeing change over time to your building and the land in which it sits and also the immediate environment. These are my map and image files for the Cloudsley Centre, the former Holy Trinity Church. And I'd collect these sequences of plans for every church I was working on, but it was especially useful in this case because very few early drawings um, or designs survive because the architect, Sir Charles Barry, is said to have burned them. Um, what follows now is a selection from, um, of plans um, from early days onwards to indicate how maps and plans can help plot the building's history. These are the plans attached to the conveyance. One originates with the parish of Islington and the other with the Cloudsley trustees, which owned the estate where the church was built. Um, so estate records can be another avenue for research. And we had a question this morning about um, Cloudsley, and the name I could not remember of the donor is Sir Richard Cloudsley, who donated the land um, in 1517 to the parish of Islington. Uh, these are maps of the 1840s and 1860s, showing the church before, um, you probably can't see because we're, our faces are on top of it, um, before the addition of vestries um, at the east end. Again, part of it's concealed, but um, never mind that now. Um, this is of 1871 and 1920 on the right, um, showing the vestries in place. Um, you can on the on the left hand side. You can see at the bottom of the, in the um, southeast corner, the vestries gone in, and it, it just helps us show when and how the building changed. Some of these photographs um, are photos of hard copies in archival collections, but others are taken from the range of online map databases. And I put a link to those at the end of the presentation, together with the other um, catalog, um, catalogs and so on. As we saw earlier, each church or other building will probably have archival material dispersed through several collections, and each will be different. In addition to the local archive and for Middlesex and Greater London churches, um, London Metropolitan Archives, it's likely that Lambeth Palace archives will contain some sources related to parish property within the Church of England. And there are two parts to the archive, as I mentioned. One of these, which we can see here is Luna, which contains digitized material relating to churches, including what we can see here, um, incorporated church building society plans. Um, and also, incidentally, to Church of England schools. And the other part is the main catalogue um, to other kinds of documents. Uh, you'll see here, incidentally, that Holy Trinity has been abbreviated to high tie, and why it can be a good thing to keep search terms brief. 
um, though of course having a distinctive name such as Cloudsley is helpful. But, but watch for spellings, uh, modern, um, modern slips and historical variations. I still have trouble with the E's in Cloudsley. The British Library has a range of images of churches and some parish maps, and these blow up quite well. And at the moment, you don't need library membership to view them. Um, so do have a look. These are for the King's topographical collection, two churches in Middlesex, as was. Um, the Historic England Archive, this has lots of uh, useful things, thousands of historic images and more recent photographs, all kinds of um, buildings. And this is um, the Historic England Britain from Above website, which I can't recommend enough. This is particularly useful, I find, for churchyards and for roofs. On the left is a detail of St George Hamworth in West London. Um, you can see the churchyard there, and there are several images, um, so you can almost get 360 degree view in the early 20th century. And on the right are photographs of um, Wren's St Michael Paternoster Square, which I'm again, sorry, it's partly blacked out. Um, and these are really good um, for looking at before and after images of bomb damage and what happened to the roof. And in this case, the photographs help with other documentation to show us that the profile of the roof was lowered in the post-war restoration, and that returning it to the line of Wren's original um, would create more space. And I'd add, um, these images to my lists of maps to track change over time. Returning to Holy Trinity, um, some views of the church around the time it was opened in 1829 and in about 1850. And pictures as well as being very pretty can reveal things like the original rainwater goods, the railings, um, as well as more major changes. Moving back into the 20th century, Photographs and aerial shots are, as we saw, very useful for the roof. Um, and these are some of the last views of the railings before they're moved in the war. And you can see on the left that the pepper pot, the left-hand pepper pot looks to have just been um, restored, which corresponds with some um, archival documentation to the same effect. And I also collect as many images of the interior as I can find to check change over time. Photographs often record completed restoration projects, which can help with dating the images. So, you know, think about why someone bothered to set up a camera and take the picture. So, what do you do with all the material? To recap, there are two main purposes for my part of the research on Holy Trinity. First, to assist the conservation architects and the wider project team in their work in conserving the building while making it fit for the future. And secondly, to help with the volunteer histories and exhibition that formed part of the community project, Tales from the Crypt. And in turn, their knowledge and findings fed back into my research. We've found that a useful and simple way of storing and sharing this research is in the form of a document which other than um, an illustrated title page and short introduction is a simple transcription of potential, all potentially useful sources found organized in date order, written up as you or I, in my case, went along. It also contains extracts from topographical and architectural histories. Unlike the image files, um, there are usually no copyright restrictions on transcribed text from archives so it's worth double checking if you are planning on making a document in any way public, um, perhaps especially multiple documents. And also um, always credit sources um, and give the reference code. Um, just the, the opening pages so you get an idea what it looks like. It can be treated as a long historical document or just search for keywords. By this method, we can quickly recap on um, say, when and where the organ was moved, when the key faculties were issued and so on. I have separate documents for the images, but you can also include basic information from photographs in the sequence, such as when railings last appear um, prior to or during the Second World War. 
By this stage in your research, you would have worked out that church building and parish records are generated by different bodies, and they end up in different archives, mostly according to which body created and deposited them. And you will understand the records better if you know how and why they were generated. In our case, Holy Trinity is what was known as a commissioner's church, after the commissioners for building and promoting the building of additional churches in populous districts. The commissioners made arrangements with the parish of Islington to build three additional chapels with encouragement from the charismatic vicar of St Mary's, the Reverend Daniel Wilson. The commissioners produced their own records, so I checked these for Holy Trinity, and since Sir Charles Barry was architect of all three new chapels and they shared some of the same building contractors, I checked the other two at the same time. Um, these records are quite brief and not all the books survive, but they do chart the process of building as it happened through to completion. Um, I've therefore left one of the most important things until last. Finding out as much as you can about your church is important to understanding its history, but you'll greatly improve your understanding if you also understand its relationship to others being built or significantly altered in the same period. Likewise, gaining an understanding of contemporary movements and discussions within the Church of England, um, in our case, such as the provision of free seats for the poor or the drive to abolish pew rents, um, will help you to understand changes to your own church. Many churches were reordered in the 19th century to suit changes in religious practice. The influence of the Oxford movement was so extensive in this respect that um, very few churches in England do not display at least some traces of it and it in, um, also impacted on pewing. Box pews were regarded as unsightly and unsuitable for new forms of churchmanship. Um, so modern bench pews became the norm, um, very often um, within the Diocese of London anyway, reconstructed from the seating which they replaced. So it's very useful and probably essential to do some secondary research. And I put up a book of um, a, um, M. H. Port here to make the point a slide of um, his book, sorry, um, about the movement that lay behind the building to see how it was funded, to see if and how it's the same or different to others locally or nationally, and thus to understand it in its wider context. And this will help you to under understand its significance. Researching and writing statements of significance and need. Um, will help you to understand your church, its history and architecture, and previous changes that have taken place, um, how and why your building developed the way it did, and why it's unique to your community. Um, and these statements are a requirement for building projects at listed places of worship. A statement of significance should describe the various parts of your building, when they were constructed, and when notable additions were made to the exterior and the interior, including furnishings and stained glass. And you can see how the chronology of sources document that I just showed you um, could form the basis for this, both as a point of reference for the person delegated to lead on the writing, um, statement writing and the wider team. The statement of significance should summarize why each part of the church is important to the character of the whole building and to your community. It's a useful resource for anyone with responsibility for church fabric or furnishings and encourages good steward stewardship of your building. It should be revisited at regular intervals and all times this is a working document, it's not a work of art. Uh, since 2001, it's been necessary to have statements of significance and statements of needs to accompany faculty proposals, um, which are likely to have a major impact on statutory listed buildings church buildings. In addition to faculty petitions, statements of significance and need um, can also be used to support applications for grant funding or planning permission. However, many dioceses encourage all churches to use statements of significance and need to plan for the future, when, whether you're thinking about making applications or not. Um, a statement of significance outlines what is most important and special about your church. It should put it into a wider context, its urban or landscape setting, and explain why certain things are significant. And this can be updated if and when um, you want to make changes to it or you discover something new about it. 
a statement of need relates to a specific proposal for change and allows a PCC to explain what it wants to do and, and why, um, and should help to identify how the changes will impact upon the church building um, before um, you get to the faculty or planning process stage. Your diocese may well have online information or advice about preparing these statements, um, but if not, check out the um, websites of neighbouring dioceses or, or just have a Google. The Church Build Project Guide website, where these bullet points are taken from, I find extremely helpful. Um, so we hope that as well as offering some basic advice on statements, um, my two sessions will enable you to understand um, what's significant about your church building and its landscape setting and also hopefully to identify what elements um, would make for the basis of a, an engaging community project centered on your church. So I'll stop sharing. Are there any questions? Thank you, Rebecca. Um, there's, one, there's one question in the um, chat room from Tessa Hilda, which I think is probably for you, Rosie. About, did the project budget include the whole cost of producing the conservation management plan, i.e. did the uh, lottery grant meet most of the cost of this? Ooh. You need to unmute. Um, so uh, it didn't. It included Rebecca's time for researching um, the records and history of the building and um, the work that she produced was put into the conservation management plan, but we actually secured funding from Historic England as part of the professional fees for the um, repairs grant to develop the conservation management plan. So it, it was a separate pot of funding, but it's um, very useful to be able to, to match different pots of funding so that you can um, make the budget stretch further. Now I saw Hazel had a question. Um, thank you, yes. It, it was actually a, a, a rather specific question to Rebecca. Um, we've got a Victorian enamel glass and so I just don't know whether, are there specific places to look for records about um, stained glass, enamel glass, and the history thereof, and, and sort of fashions in it, and things like that. I'm thinking very hard. Um, I'm sure there are, but I can't think of them off the top of my head. Um, all I can think of is a new, a recent book on 20th century stained glass, which won't help you. Um, can we get back to you on that? Yeah, please, please do. Thank you. Um, I'm sure between us we'd know. Rosie? Yes, I was just actually going to say, um, Hazel, if you want to email, I don't know, maybe Becky, um, your email address, Rebecca could, if she found out anything more, email you back? Yep. Would that be okay? Would that work? Yep, very good. It'd be good for me to know that anyway. <laughs> Smashing. Um, Oh, Dirk, you got a question. With the deconsecration of the church in 1979, and now its refurbishment and its renaming as the Cloudsley Centre, when will the statement of its future significance become available? Is that an appropriate question? I think that's another one for Rosie, sorry. <laughs> um, it's future significance, gosh. Uh, well, I mean, clearly it's, um, it's significance um, due to its architecture, um, its cultural significance and um, its architect is very important and I don't think that will ever really change. Um, its future significance, I suppose, as we progress through time may, may change in terms of um, sort of culturally. Um, but I, to be honest, hadn't thought about that. 
much and therefore um, perhaps don't have a very immediate answer. Sorry, it's a good point and perhaps one that I should think about. Um, uh, but but uh, other than seeing how it progresses as time goes, I can't really comment. Was there anything else? I can you see that it has a I can see that it's got a historical significance with regard to Richard Cloudsley and his bequest uh, to Stonefield Street of 14 acres in 1517 and its building as a church. I can see its significance as that historically. Um, but with its deconsecration in uh, 1979, it's no longer um, a, a church. Um, what is its future? What is its significance? As a local resident, what is its significance to the community for the future? Well, I think its significance to the community is, um, is significant because it is a building, um, you know, it's an imposing building. Um, it is going to be used um, for community uses. Therefore, hopefully, it will become a very important building in the future. So I, just because it's no longer a church doesn't mean to say it's not um, in any way important or significant. I, I, yes, I guess what I'm trying to get to is, is it can't just stand there as a sculptural, architectural thing. It's got to be a functional usage for the community. I'm, right. trying, to, I'm trying to bottom out what the future functional usage might be. Well, yes. And at the moment, as I said, we have change that but we are looking at developing a business plan for the building over the next sort of three to four months so i think that will firm up our thoughts as to um uh, how we would make it more culturally significant um within the community and that uh, process will involve clearly community consultation as well can i just throw in something rosie yes um just to say, um, the lives of those who are buried in the crypt, they are going to stay buried in the crypt. So it has, it certainly meets the communal significance, albeit of a past community. And I think that's one of the um, very rewarding aspects of the volunteers who research those characters and individuals, because I know it's cliched, but they brought some of their, their, their the details of their life back in, you know, in common knowledge. and those people lived in the houses that you and your neighbours live in. And that connectedness, um, I think, in terms of statements of significance, I think we have in enhanced that, that work and that research. So it's not precisely the church architecture, the fact it's no longer open for worship, but how it has been used by past communities, I think is a very valuable aspect of its character going forward. Is that okay? There's a question from Christine Sorry. Bartlett about um, how do you go about trawling through old documents such as vestry minutes? Do you just sit down in the library and type up any relevant entries? I think that's for Rebecca. Um, the way I work is unless they are very few and far between, I photograph everything and then do that at home just because I don't always live near the archive in question. And it speeds it up um, and you can do it at your leisure but yes so I as I'm photographing I mark out anything that looks immediately useful um, and it really depends on the size of the, the minutes um, and in, well it, actually that's not true in some cases I wasn't able to photograph because they're on microfilm for example some of the Westminster churches um, so I did transcribe I spent days transcribing, um, which is, although it's time consuming and hard on the wrists, actually reading them on the way home it, it was much less daunting than having 500 photographs to go through. So it varies on whether they're on microfilm um, or hard copy and how plentiful they are. For example, the Holy Trinity ones, it's, they were very short, it's just an Easter vestry in most years, unless there was an extraordinary meeting held when there was a problem. Um, but and Susan will tell you the same. It, they are, it's very easy to get sidetracked into stories and following people up. 
um, said it could be done much more quickly, probably just getting to the nuts and bolts of the building history. But because the, the stories of the people in the parish are so engaging, it took a bit longer. But you know, all this is, um, you know, when you can get back in to look at them, I guess. So good luck. One more question from um, Sandra from the Cultural Healing Communities it asks, can you advise any fund that could support the investigation of a property to bring it back from the dead and give it back to the community for their enjoyment and use? That's quite a general question. Um, we well, are hearing from the NCT, from, um, from Jess. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, there, there are a number of, of funds. I mean, the lottery is one of them um, because the building in question doesn't, now need to be classified as a heritage building. Um, it can be the heritage of the area or your community that you're researching and investigating. So they're definitely um, a funder to look at when they open up for new applications again. I was also, yeah. Sorry, I was going to say, and um, Jess is uh, obviously talking from the National Churches Trust as well, so she'll be able to tell you about funding. I was going to say there is also the um, Heritage Alliance funding directory, uh, which has just been relaunched. If you go to their website, um, you'll find it and you just type in a few key words and that should bring up um, a lot of funding sources that might be relevant. So go to the Heritage Alliance website. Okay, I think I think we've got all we've had all questions. Um, Rebecca. Rebecca has a question. I don't have a question. I have a very quick point. Susan has um, just texted me to say that Googling Stained Glass Museum, Hazel, um, brings up a good link to start with. <laughs> Make yourself a cup of tea. Very good. Okay. Um, in which case, if we move on to the next presentation, which is me. Um, here we go. Hopefully everybody can see that. Can you see that? Yes. Fab. Okay, smashing. So um, this is a presentation about how you might go about developing your own project. Um, and the first slide is probably quite pertinent. Where to begin? Um, the HLF sorry, I should say National Lottery Heritage Fund. Um, I like, I just tend to just call them Heritage Fund or even just the lottery these days because it's such a mouthful otherwise. Um, like uh, the group that has come together to try and sit down and think about what success would look like. Um, and by doing that, it, you just need to sit down and think, well, where do we want this building and this community to be in, say, five or ten years' time? And that's a very good starting point for trying to get people to uh, articulate their own ideas um, and aspirations. Um, and with that, you then uh, try and pull them together into a project vision. So... Um, one of the things then, and I will talk through this in more detail as I go, is um, you then need to try and set some boundaries for your project as to how far you're going to go and how far you're going to investigate and what you're going to do. Um, very importantly, you do need to understand what need there is for the project within the community. So um, there's no point, um, I remember once working uh, with a community group who wanted to set up a museum to display brake linings on vehicles. And whilst they were fascinated by this as uh, a project and a concept, and that's absolutely smashing, um, we did have to, to say we didn't think many people would actually be interested in that. So it's important that you go out and you consult and you understand 
just what other people would be interested in and what the need in the community is for in terms of space, in terms of activities. Um, so as you're doing that, clearly you need to uh, collect your evidence um, because you will need to provide that to any funder who is wishing uh, or potentially considering uh, funding your project. Um, going on a bit further, most funders would like to understand what your um, project aims and objectives are, um, what outcomes you will deliver for their funding, and um, they will obviously want you to undertake project evaluation to show uh, have you actually achieved what you set out to deliver. So I'm going to quite quickly talk through these concepts because um, I accept there's quite a lot of information there and um, uh, I don't take up too much time. So um, I have just tried to throw out some interesting images as we go along. The reason I like this image is because um, it just, it's a softer image. One of the architects drew it and I think it's really nice to have images that aren't always just photographs um, of a building. It's important to have images that are softer or of people and activities. So um, it's really important when you, when you set out with your project that everybody in the group would sit down and would actually jointly develop a project vision. Um, because if you don't do that together and you don't have the discussion where you go, mm, do you really think that? No, mm, well, I'm not sure what does that actually mean? You don't then um, bottom out just, just exactly what your agreed project vision is. So um, I have led a number of workshops where I have uh, helped groups and organizations actually develop a project vision. And um, it's quite simple in that you just ask everybody to write down what they would like their project to achieve in one sentence. And then we look at all the individual sentences and we collectively combine and agree that uh, the separate sentences into one sentence and then you might want to um, expand it into a paragraph if that's more appropriate or develop a project strap line um, but it does mean that and it doesn't need to take very long but it does mean that um, as a group you've sat down and you've come together and you've got a project vision you can all sign up to and that's very important because if you don't do that you might find that people are um, unknowingly still just thinking um, different things and that can create problems in the future. So here is a project um, I did actually uh, sit down and do a workshop with and create a project vision and it is Chance Glassworks and the organizers um, and the community group there wanted to acquire the site and um, refurbish the heritage buildings at Chance Glassworks into a a vibrant mixed use scheme. So the agreed project vision that they came up with um, was to regenerate Chance Glassworks to protect and celebrate its highly significant industrial heritage, um, to act as a beacon of hope and create a new vibrant um, urban community generating employment, training, learning and leisure opportunities for all. So it's quite broad a project vision but the point about it is um, that the trustees all came together and they all signed up to this as the vision as to what they wanted to achieve from the site. So ideally once you've uh, established a project vision the next thing to do is then to scope the size of the project and um, this is this is really quite it's extremely important and where I talked originally about the going to the national lottery and saying could we please start to have conversations about a capital repair grant and they said no not really it's too soon um it's very important that you start to think about um what you're going to achieve and maybe to split it up into bite-sized manageable chunks um i mean the shape of of the funding world has changed somewhat. In the past, you might just go straight into a big capital project, but now 
you need to show that you're a, a group that can actually manage the funding that you're given um, and that you can spend it successfully. So when you're looking at the project, you might look at in terms of is the building in poor condition? What works need to be done to the building? Do you have any collections or archive that need to be researched or displayed? Um, and that's very much focusing on the church and its contents. Um, but the reality is you need to then think wider to the local community and to people who might come and want to visit your building. So you would look at, is there a special interest market um, is there a need in the local community? So would you want to try and create some space within your building um, for community use? And clearly a lot of churches do this. Um, so do we uh, have a church hall? Could we use that for, um, uh, for example, the mother and toddler group um, for uh, sale, bring and buy sales for exhibitions? Um, for communities to come and meet and hold events, There's all sorts of options that you can you can look at, and you need to go out um, and you need to understand who is in the community, who might want to use your building that doesn't already. Do people who use your building want to use it for other things or for more things? Um, so going out and consulting um, broadly is very important and. Um, that can be done obviously face to face, it can be done with online surveys um, and it can be done through pilot activities. So you can say, okay, let's see if we hold this event, will people come? And that's also very good at um, collecting evidence to give to your funders to say, we've done X, Y, and Z and the result has been A, B, and C. Um, so that project scoping happens at the start of the project and is very important in terms of shaping how you think you will develop it over the next few years. Uh, in terms of the Tales from the Crypt project, um, how did we go about uh, identifying the need and scoping the project? Well, first of all, um, we undertook a community audit to see what were the local community groups in the area. And we had uh, consulted with them as to what they needed, how they would want to be involved. Um, we therefore um, used that evidence um, uh, to input into our application and to shape our project. We also um, were quite fortunate being with the Diocese of London that um, they could afford to employ a fundraiser to write the application for us. And a lot of um, churches aren't in that fortunate position. But on the other hand, there may be um, a member of the congregation that's experienced in writing grant applications that might volunteer and to help or be prepared to lead on that basis. So it's always worth seeing if there's somebody out there who might help um, develop that side of the project. Um, when the next step was to pull together the project team who might be involved, and that was um, primarily myself, uh, Susan, um, Rebecca. We also spoke to Laura Moffat from Art and Christianity and she helped with the art workshops. Um, we undertook further consultation with potential partners once we were really trying to shape up our ideas and at that point some partners fell away, other partners came to the fore. Um, don't be upset or worried if that happens, it's perfectly natural, plans change and um, it's good to go with them. Oh, lordy mercy. Um, I don't know what to do now. Uh, um, Oh, I'll just ignore it. Um, so uh, we set out then um, our project proposals um, so we could understand what exactly we were trying to achieve from the project. Um, we selected the key project outcomes from the lottery fund. Um, and uh, we very much discussed which were the priority ones for our project rather than um, uh, trying to uh, achieve all the HLF outcomes. And I think it's very important um, because they've got a number of outcomes, don't feel you need to achieve all of them. Um, we then went ahead and submitted our project inquiry form and the feedback 
from that you get from the heritage fund at this stage is hugely important and definitely um, must be listened to developed on because you know they really do know how to advise and to help you shape your application so uh, as i said i've never worked on a on a heritage project where they haven't actually made the project so much better by inputting their advice and guidance so it's really worth listening to them and then um finally we submitted and uh, developed the grant application when i'm um, looking at fundraising i've already flagged you know is there a, a volunteer locally that you might be able to ask to help you develop the application? If you have some funding, are you able to employ someone to help you? Um, obviously, we'll be hearing later about potential fundraising, but these are a number of fundraising uh, sources that you can investigate. And Becky talked about the Heritage Alliance fundraising directory. So that's definitely worth looking at. Um, there will be local trusts and foundations that you want to um, look at that will only be relevant for your area and it's important that you try and identify them. Um, and then some of the key church uh, funders clearly are National Churches Trust, but the All Churches Trust and then the listed places of worship scheme is important um, for helping you reclaim VAT on project fees and um, the VAT on actual capital works. So um, the HLF very much likes you to set out what are your project aims and objectives. Um, and I think the key thing about them is to work out how you're going to actually describe these. Um, I like to, to say, you know, if you think of a staircase, your aims are your steps along the way. Sorry, your objectives are your steps along the way to get to the aim, which is the top of the staircase. And it's important perhaps not to identify too many. Um, I've given you an example one here to deliver a volunteer led research project. And that's one of the aims that we used in our Tales from the Crypt project. And the other thing that's very important is that where we do have objectives is to make them smart. And I'm sure you've all heard of the acronym, but it's um, specific, measurable, um, oh gosh, I can't think of the other one, uh, realistic and timely. But anyway, the point is to be very direct when you're looking at objectives. So to say to fundraise a specific amount by a specific date. Um, I've read a number of grant applications where people have written, we will recruit some volunteers to help us with this. And you just go, you need to be much more specific um, when we're writing a grant application. Um, you don't have to specify that. You could put a range. You could say 10 to 15 volunteers because nobody expects you to raise um, and recruit um, an exact amount, but it's good to have a, a very good idea as to the rough number that you think you might achieve. Um, this is one of Susan's slides with volunteers receiving training, um, which was something that was provided by the Islington Museum and Heritage Centre. Um, so again, it's important to identify and scope out how much training people might receive um, and to just set out all the outcomes in your project. So this is just a little slide on outputs and outcomes. What will you actually achieve? Um, which outputs are essential and which are desirable. It's, it's worth saying, you know, if a project can't achieve everything that you set out to do, um, are there some that are not so important as others? Um, clearly, you need to think about how you'll measure um, an evidence success. So, for example, with training, you might then... Um, you would record how many people attended training sessions, how long the training session was, so you can then understand the exact output from that. And from that, you might go on and say, are there outcomes that those training sessions impacted in terms of what a volunteer then went on to do in terms of further research or um, further decisions in terms of new career options? So it's, it's important to try and see how, how the training in your project shapes people not just for the period of your project, but potentially longer term. 
And that's all part of the evaluation that you're proposing that you will undertake and that you will need to say to your funder um, when you put your application in. So this is the lottery's logic model. Um, and it might seem a little bit um, busy, but it, it is quite a simple model um, in that it says, so what, what do you need to achieve your project? And that's normally, for example, uh, time, people's time, um, money, um, what will be achieved in terms of output, so number of training sessions, number of volunteers recruited, what is your impact? Um, and it's asking people to look at short, medium and long term impact on the project. Um, and then it's important to just think you know, in terms of assumptions and external factors, are there any changes that have impacted or could impact on your project? Um, and are the assumptions that you have made correct? Um, so I think this logic model is something that you don't necessarily need to get too familiar with, but it's definitely important to be aware of it and to understand that uh, your project will need to be evaluated along these lines. Um, and then here's an example of an outcomes matrix that I had developed um, so that you can just set out all the outcomes from your project and the indicators uh, that you'll use to collect the evidence to show that you've achieved your outcome. Um, so I think it's important to uh, just be aware that that is a very quick run through how a sort of project is developed, how it evolves, how it is delivered and some of the things that, that you will need to consider when you're starting your project. Um, it does probably sound quite complicated um, if you haven't done um, a lottery funded project before. Um, but uh, it's, it, I, there's a lot of uh, advice and guidance on the lottery website and um, what I, I think the way that the HLF is advising now in terms of doing a small project to develop your confidence and understanding is very important and very helpful because that then does give you the confidence to go and apply for further funding in the future. Um, I'm just showing you some images now from the Tales from the Crypt project where we worked with um, uh, New River College and this is some of the artwork that the pupils produced based on the stories from the people in the crypt. I just thought I'd finish off very quickly if I'm not running out too much of time, which I am actually, with uh, hints and tips. So I'd say that the lottery can sniff out very, very quickly if there's a genuine need for your project or not and if there isn't, they really won't fund it. Um, ensure that you keep evidence um, and record of any consultations that you undertake. Uh, photographs are amazing and are very important. Um, and uh, just make sure that everything that you say you're going to do is realistic and achievable. It's very easy to overpromise, and it's very important um, to try and limit the scope of your project so that you can actually deliver it. Um, finally, I would say uh, contingency is hugely important because I made this point earlier. Um, you will always forget to put in something. So it's really important to make sure you've got that little extra pot of funding of cash so that you can do something else to make your project even better. So sorry, that's me. Um, I think I've gone over a little bit. Uh, any questions? There are a couple. Um, we have um, we have someone someone asking what consultation method, methods have you found to be the most successful in terms of engagement and quality of feedback? Um, okay, I would say that the most successful are having an open day, inviting people to come around the building and to hear from the project team, and then you can actually stand and chat to them. Um, and I always do that with a feedback form and ask them to fill out a feedback form, but it's actually standing and talking to people that gets the best result. And, um, uh, and that's where you get good ideas from people as well. You know, I genuinely believe that if you consult with people, you should be prepared to listen to what they have to say. Um, 
it, and you'd be surprised how many people don't. So do actually engage and then think about um, uh, in, introducing their feedback and their ideas into your project. It makes it so much more successful. Um, and another one from Christine um, asking, what sort of things were the grant money spent on? Um, I'm not sure what that's in reference to particular, particularly. Um, I was just thinking of the Cloudsley Centre, uh, yeah. the grant that you received. It seemed like a lot of money when you, you got mostly volunteers mm. working. I just wondered where, was it the exhibition itself and the equipment for the exhibition that the money was spent on? Uh, sorry, just say that one more. I was just say that. I didn't quite catch it. Well, the, the grant that you've received for the Clowsley yes. Centre. Yes. Um, you're using volunteers, so it, you haven't got staff costs. I just wondered, it, where did all the money go? Is it all on sort of exhibition equipment? So it went on, um, we did have to pay for consultants' time. So we had to pay for Rebecca's time to do the research and we had to pay for Susan's time to oh. um, manage recruit and manage the volunteers. We had to pay for the training that was delivered from Islington Museum. Um, we've had to pay for the exhibition costs in terms of printing the panels. And it had to pay obviously for my time. Um, and then we've had to pay uh, for the cost of developing the walks. So there've been a lot of costs in there that you don't necessarily think. And that's why I'm saying contingency is really important because you don't always get those costs right. Mm -hmm. um, and sorry, it's just a point I wanted to flag up in terms of um, uh, the diocese uh, paying for the fundraiser. The reason that they did that, just so you're aware, is because um, it is a closed church and then therefore it is the responsibility of the Diocese of London rather than the PCC. So I sort of hope that clarification helps. Were there any other chat questions? No, I, I don't think so. I can't see any hands up or anything. Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Oh, no, wait, we do have one. Oh, we have sorry. Jill. I see a hand. Yeah, I was just wondering why the diocese decided to take this route, since it's a closed church. Uh, well, the diocese needed to... Um, obviously, they are responsible for the the um, the building. So... You know they could have decided to sell it um and they didn't think that that was necessarily a sensible outcome um they wanted to repair the building in a sympathetic way and they wanted to do it in a way that uh the local community was on board with um so that's why they uh took on um, directly took on the project and we went down the Tales from the Crypt route in terms of uh, the community project because that is very much what the Heritage Fund advised in the first instance in order to um, it, develop our uh, community presence to then support us when we put in a capital grant for the next phase of the project. So does that mean in the ultimate, so the ultimate vision is this is going to be an income generating thing for the diocese or, or is it going to break even or? Well, I mean, that depends. We haven't got that answer yet because we haven't developed the business plan. Um, at the very least, it has to pay for itself. So it has to generate enough money to um, manage and maintain the building. Um, and it, you know, it, it is an old building. It is going to cost a lot to maintain in the future. So it's got to generate a reasonably significant return to look after itself, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, questions? So, well, I, I think we're done. Shall we move on to Jess White, who is um, from the National Churches Trust and... Yeah. Um, she is obviously going to, to speak to us about um, the grants that they have available and what they do. Thank yes. you. Hello. Hi. Um, 
So yes, I am Jess. I'm from the National Churches Trust. Um, I haven't yet done a Zoom presentation, so I'm not quite sure no how this is going to go. Um, there we are. Yeah, great stuff. Great. Okay. Let me just grab my notes one second. Fab. Um, so yes, I'm Jess. Um, I'm one of the church support officers at the National Churches Trust. It's been really interesting hearing about the Cloudsley Centre this morning and all the heritage works that's going on there. Um, so I'm just going to briefly talk about what we offer at the NCT um, and the grant programmes mainly since I have limited time in this presentation. Um, so my main role is processing and assessing the grant applications and giving support and advice to churches. So the National Churches Trust promotes and supports over 42,000 places of worship uh, in the UK. And we believe that all of these places of worship have value, whether that's historic, architectural or community value. We're quite a small team. Um, we have a combination of office-based workers and remote workers, but obviously because of the pandemic, we're all working remotely at the moment. And we believe that this regional spread is important because it enables us to reach and engage with the whole of the UK rather than just the local area, um, such as where our office is based in London. Um, we currently have four members of staff on grant assessing uh, alongside other things such as church support. We are a charity, meaning that we rely on donations to provide our grants. We also have an active friends group uh, to whom we send out regular newsletters. The charity has been going for over 200 years. Um, although it's had several different names and aims, the NCT as we know it today was founded in 2007. We aim to help maintain the UK's heritage of church buildings, enhance their ability to serve their local communities, promote the benefit of church buildings to communities and inspire everyone to value and enjoy them. It's important to note that we are not only a grant giver, we also offer advice and support to churches about repairs, maintenance, development and tourism. We produce publications, we run surveys and competitions. So, we have various grant programmes covering a range of budgets and types of work, um, mainly structural repairs, maintenance, new facilities and project development. Sadly, we don't fund everything, but we do provide advice on where else to go for help if your project doesn't quite fit within our programmes. Um, we have three decision rounds per year. We're currently in the middle of our final round of the year at the moment. Um, and these are for our bigger grants. Final decisions are made by our independent grants committee made up of experts. As with other funders, we receive many more requests than we can meet. Uh, so we have a success rate of roughly one in four for our Cornerstone grant programme, which as you can see offers the highest amount of funding. It's important to note that our grants will never total more than 50% of the project costs. I will come on to eligibility criteria in a moment, but just thought I would mention that our grants are available to listed and unlisted places of worship in the UK um, that have at least six regular services per year. Right, so on to our eligibility criteria. Uh, churches must be located in the UK. Uh, they need to have been originally built as a place of worship. So sadly, we couldn't fund your project if say your church that you use now was originally built as a church hall. Uh, works can't have started at the time of application. 50% uh, of the funds need to be raised at the time of application. The building needs to be open 100 days a year. Um, if this is not possible, then we would hope that this would happen within one year of completion of the project. Um, if your building is listed, we require that a conservation accredited architect or surveyor leads the project. If your building isn't listed, this isn't a necessary requirement, but it still remains to be good practice. And we require that all necessary permissions, whether that's list B, consent or faculty permissions if you're Anglican, or permission from your governing body if you're not Anglican, to be in place at the time of application. We also require that two quotes should be in place when you apply. And we also have a guidance note on each of our programmes 
So these are available via our website on the relevant programme page. And I strongly recommend having a read through this before assembling the application, uh, just to ensure that you've covered everything and you have the most, most likelihood of making it through to our second round of assessments. So our foundation grants are mainly for maintenance. So we offer rewards of between 500 and 5,000 pounds for these for projects up to £10,000. So examples of what these might be could be roof repairs or repointing masonry or some repairs to rainwater goods or guttering. And this programme has the highest success rate. On average, one in two applicants receive funding. We awarded 85 of these grants in 2019, averaging £4,000, uh, £4,279 to be precise. Uh, last year we decided that these decisions should be made on a rolling basis every month um, rather than at one of our three grants committee meetings in the year just because it, then it makes it easier for churches to manage their building rather than having to wait several months for a decision for what are potentially quite small items of routine maintenance. And the eligibility criteria for these are much the same as mentioned in the last slide Again, do check out the guidance note on our website for more information. An example of a church that received a foundation grant from us uh, was Monmouth Methodist Church um, last year in July. So they received a £3,000 grant from us in order to repair leaking gutters and broken down pipes and also to repair upper windows. Um, so we want to know when we are looking at your application for these projects whether there'll be a permanent resolution if the maintenance or repair issue is um, addressed, or if there'll be a significant reduction of the issue. If our grant will facilitate the means to avoid or deal with these recurrent issues, or if it will enable an investigation of a potential problem to identify the risks and find solutions to those risks. So our gateway program offers awards between 3,000 and 10,000 pounds. It's slightly more competitive than the foundation programme and it's limited by funds available. Um, in 2019, there were 12 awards nationwide averaging £6,000. It offers funding for project development up to REBA stage one, which would include things such as feasibility studies, option appraisals and detailed reports to better understand the issue. So these can help support churches who are preparing for a major project in developing their project to the point that they could then go and approach a major grant funder. The eligibility criteria are again much the same as the foundation grant programme, meaning we'd need two quotes and 50% of funds in, in place for this funding. Uh, one example of a church that received one of these grants from us was St. Sam uh, St. Sampson's in South Hill, um, which is the church in the pictures in the presentation here. So they received £1,795 from us towards their St Sampson's Unlocked project. Um, this is a smaller grant than we would award now, but that was according to our previous criteria. Um, they needed the grant to update their community consultation to ensure that the, pro the proposal still met the needs of their local community and also to help pay their architects fees for advice on phasing or altering the original proposals. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm losing my voice slightly. Um, our gateway grants also can be allocated to repairs. So these would be awards of between 5,000 and 10,000 pounds for essential repairs costing between 10,000 and 100,000. Um, we would like to see 50% of funds in place in two quotes. And these repairs should also have been identified in the most recent quinquennial inspection report or a condition survey um, as a priority repair. Um, a recipient of this funding was St Pancras Old Church in London in our most recent round, which was in July. They received a £5,000 grant from us and another £5,000 grant from the Wolfson Foundation through which we allocated on the Wolfson's behalf, but I'll get onto that later. 
um, for urgent structural repairs due to internal movement at the junction between the south wall of the chancel and the south wall of the nave. And finally, our Cornerstone grant programme. Uh, this is for the most money. Um, we offer awards between 10,000 and 50,000 for this, uh, for projects costing over 100,000 if they are repairs or over 30,000 if they are for facility installation, um, such as kitchens and toilets. Uh, this is the most competitive grant program with a success rate of around one in four. In 2019, we awarded 58 grants, averaging around £15,000. St Julieta uh, in Lanteglos by Camelford in Cornwall was one example of a recipient of this funding. So they received a 40,000 repair grant in March 2018. Their total project cost was 413,000. Their church was grade one listed and it had quite a high index of multiple deprivation, meaning that it was um, in the 10% of the most deprived communities in the country. It was also on Historic England's Heritage at Risk Register as Priority A, uh, meaning that the condition was very poor. And the work involved roof repairs, structural repairs to the tower, stonework repointing, etc. cetera. Um, and we were only able to fund some aspects of the work, but that's, it was still el eligible for our funding. And we funded this project due to its high need and good demonstration of what impact the church will have on the community. Great, so we score applications on their heritage, so whether their building is listed or recognised as historically significant. The need, so how great the urgency is for the project to happen now and the level of deprivation in the community and why the church needs the National Churches Trust's funding. The case for investment, so how much effort has gone into local fundraising and community consultation, the opening hours of the church and how close to starting the project is. The risk management, so whether the project has been well thought through and is appropriate for the issue described, whether it's being led by a conservation accredited professional. And the impacts, so whether the application demonstrates that it will have impacts on heritage, sustainability and support. Um, more on this particular aspect will be mentioned in the next slide. Uh, you'll see that I mentioned the priority areas at the bottom of the slide here. This is just because there was, a pre there was previously a geographical disparity um, in, in our grant coverage. But this doesn't mean that your church is excluded from our funding just by nature of where it is in the UK. It just represents our commitment to try and fund a wide, the, the widest spread that we can of, of the UK. So here's some information on what we mean by the heritage and community impacts. By preserving heritage, we are looking to see whether the dam will be in better condition, such as being removed from the risk register or watertight for another 100 years if, if your project is to um, fix roof repairs, for instance, that the roof was leaking previously. Whether the building will be better managed, um, so whether you'll be putting this plan in place or there'll be improved maintenance access, uh, that the building and heritage will be better understood. So this might mean a new website or a revised guidebook or new interpretive material, new events, etc. By um, like sustainability, we're looking at whether the building will be more suitable for wider community uses, such as it will enable more users to access the building uh, or address local demand and gaps in services currently provided whether the building will be more secure for the future, meaning maybe the changes will boost income or whether uh, there'll be greater engagement with the community or whether the repairs will be met so there'll be no further outgoings, etc. And whether the problems will be diagnosed or the projects have been well planned, such as viability studies, options, appraisals, business. And then finally, we're looking to see if the church will engage with more people, meaning that the changes might open opportunities to welcome more and different people, as demonstrated by consultation. Whether there'll be increased opportunity for fundraising, no, sorry, for volunteering, and whether the place of worship will be more financial, 
financially viable. So the top tips I could give would be read the guidance note before applying, supply all the documents that we request and meet the deadlines. In your answers on the application form, please let us know why your project is essential and why you need our support, how the project is well planned, viable and sustainable, how your community is engaged and the benefits and impacts of your project. Overall, aim to explain what you currently do, but also ensure to tell us what you'll be doing going forward. The firmer the plans, the better. Show that you've made an effort to fundraise as much as possible within your capabilities as well. Uh, from earlier this year, the NCT started awarding grants on behalf of the Wilson Foundation. These awards are for essential fabric repairs to churches in the UK, usually up to £10,000, and they're offered in partnership with the Wilson Foundation. They'll be allocated to eligible applicants through either our Gateway or our Cornerstone programme. To be eligible, churches can be of any denomination based in the UK, but they must be listed as either Grade 1 or two star in England and Wales, grade A or B plus listed in Northern Ireland and grade A or B listed in Scotland. Repairs will also usually be identified as category A or B in the most recent quinquennial inspection report uh, or as urgent repairs in a recent condition report. Typically projects would include roof repairs, masonry repairs, rainwater disposal and drainage and floor work. These are our upcoming deadlines. Um, so foundation applications can be submitted on a rolling basis with monthly decisions. And the final deadline for this year um, is the 30th of October. Then for the Gateway programme, the next deadline is very, very soon. It's in two days. Um, so if you could quickly rustle up an application by then, then I'd be impressed. But um, it's worth a shot if you think you can. And then mid-January for a decision in March, if you don't quite manage to get it in for this round. And the next cornerstone deadline is 2nd of November for a decision in March. And then one in March and one in July for decisions in 2021. And these are my contact details. Um, please do get in touch if you have any questions that you think of after the Q&A session just now. Uh, I'll be very happy to help if you have anything that you'd like to ask about. And we also have some support and advice information to send on to you as well if our funding doesn't quite meet what your project um, hopes to do. So that's me. Thank you. Um, I see we've got a present uh, question on chat. In fact, we've got two. Um, We've got the first one saying, we find churches have real difficulty raising the first 50%. And many, many other funders also like to be the last contributor. Is there any possibility you would consider offering grants at an earlier stage for the first half of the funding? Um, so that is something that I think has been considered by the NCT before when our grant strategy has been um, discussed and re revised. Um, we, we have the 50% rule in place just to ensure that our funding will definitely be going towards a project that will reach completion. It's feedback that I'm very happy to pass on. Um, I'm not quite sure if I can make any promises right now on this Zoom call about whether we'll be able to change that strategy. Uh, something I would recommend would be if your church is listed, the listed places of worship VAT rebate uh, scheme is a really good way of um, quickly boosting your funds from 0% to 20% because if, you're, if your building's listed, you'll get the VAT back on the project. Um, but no, the only thing I can, I can really offer you right now is to pass on that feedback. Um, and there is another question. It says, when will the foundation program reopen? It yeah. Says, so, um, it will close for a decision this year on the 30th of October, but then reopen in January for more rolling based, uh, monthly rolling decisions in 2021. Okay. I think you've got a question from Hazel. Yeah. Um, hi. 
Could I just clarify about the Wolfson Foundation um, aspect? Is that, as it were, an additional grant available if you meet all the eligibility and whatever? Or is it a way of boosting the funds that the trust can use to support? Sorry, have I distinguished between the two? Mm -hmm. So it is an additional grant provided you meet the eligibility criteria. Um, yeah. So say uh, I mentioned St Pancras Old Church who received a gateway grant from us. They received £5,000 from us and then an additional £5,000 from the Wolfson Foundation. So it's a way of um, making, hard to phrase it, get, getting even more money for the application that you put in. Um, so no, it's, it's not a way of boosting our funds, it's us allocating on their behalf. Okay, thank you. So are there any more questions? If not, um, I would like to say thank you very much to all the speakers. Um, and also thank you very much to... Oh, Dirk, sorry, you've got one. Uh, a question for you, Rebecca, not specifically for Jeff. My understanding is that the trees, the large plane trees around Holy Trinity Church were not part of the original design, but were subsequent. They present a significant danger to the structure of the building, both at root level um, but also at treetop level. My understanding was that some 47 sacks of leaves were removed from the roof and the guttering, and these had caused significant uh, dilapidations to the roof and its structure. Are there any plans in the future uh, for assessing these trees, the dangers they present, and how to uh, mitigate those dangers? Seems to me that we are spending many millions of pounds on the roof um, and we're not addressing perhaps the cause of why the roof ran into such problems. I don't want to back this back to you, Rosie, particularly, but that may be one for you. I know that on the planning, the council's planning portal, you can trace previous tree surgery and there may be more details about those trees, but I'm afraid I can't. Um, I think there is a plan to pollard them more severely um, uh, in 2021, but uh, I wouldn't be able to confirm that as yet. Because you've just spent a huge amount of money on repairing the roof. Soon we'll have a huge uh, leaf fall. Those gutters will get blocked again. And one of the routine tasks of me as a householder here and for my sons is clearing gutters, etc., in the autumn, and it just seems to me that we we need to actually have some plan for addressing those issues. Yes, long term. Um, yeah, and and there is. So as I said, there's there's a plan to pollard them more severely, um, but I haven't got exact details of that. And obviously, there's a maintenance and management plan put in place for the building, so that would include clearing out gutters. Um, okay, uh, so that's smashing. If that's everybody's questions, um, thank you all very much for turning up. I hope you've coped with it being a Zoom workshop. Um, I know it's not what we planned and it's not ideal, but hopefully it um, is as, as good as it could be. So uh, thank you very much. And we will be sending out the recording and the presentations online so you can dip in and out as to what bits you found most useful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.